Hi. Um, good evening, uh, all. I'm Gwen Robinson, um, Vice President of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand and Editor at Large of Nikkei Asia. And uh, we're all here tonight, as you know, to hear more about cultural wisdom for climate action learning from Southeast Asia. Um, before we get to that, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of quick housekeeping announcements, just a couple of highlight programs we've got uh, from tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is International Women's Day, and to mark that, we've got a, a very interesting panel discussion with M Myanmar women journalists um, to put a spotlight on some of the bravest journalists in the region. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll be launching a report and have a, a lineup of interesting women journalists uh, to discuss it. And then um, on Monday, uh, March the 11th, we're, um, we're having a program uh, to highlight that commemorating the 20th year of the disappearance of Somchai Nila Pajit, uh, uh, activist from the Deep South who went who was campaigning against torture in the Deep South and went uh, missing. We'll be uh, launching a photo exhibition and have a panel discussion then. Uh, there's plenty of other things on our website and Facebook page, so please have a look and uh, come along to any of the events that interest you. And uh, now I'd like to turn to our uh, discussion at hand, uh, and the question being, how does climate change impact culture and heritage? And how can culture help to cope with climate change? Um, also, most importantly for us here, how can Southeast Asian culture serve as a basis or at least inspire people to climate change action? So the book we are launching tonight came from an event at the Siam Society in Bangkok in January last year when experts, activists and youth representatives from 10 countries of Southeast Asia met to share practical learnings in a, a number of key areas. So you're going to hear about uh, that from, the, um, uh, from a couple of the originators and some experts uh, very shortly. And to uh, introduce our panel, I'd just like to uh, start with on my far right, Dr. Chris Baker, author, historian and editor of the book we're launching, Cultural Wisdom for Climate Action, Learning from Southeast Asia. Uh, he is uh, also, ha was editor of the Journal of the Siam Society and uh, he was just telling me this was his final work for the Siam Society. He'll still be very active with the society, but he is handing over the reins of um, editing the journal, which uh, to those who are members or have seen the journal has been a really excellent um, publication for many years. Um, and then uh, on the screen, uh, Kuntam, could we introduce, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Sui Chan Patana Praiwan. Um, who's, have we got uh, Ajahn Chi on the, uh, on the screen, please? Well, um, Kuntam, can we, okay, we might come back to him. Okay, <laughs> he's, we're going to come back to him, uh, but he's going to give us the indigenous perspective on the inseparable relationship between man and nature. He unfortunately found he could not make it tonight. He's up north. Um, but he's joining us on Zoom. And then uh, next to Ajahn Chris is Chulamani Chatsuwan, a former senior foreign ministry official and ambassador who remains very active in regional diplomacy. And she's going to talk about the way forward, how to embrace culture into national climate change policy. And finally, closest to me on my immediate right is Kamorichan Ostananda, um, who's focusing on youth inclusion in climate action, particularly at COP28, where she, um, she attended. And she's a young activist working on post-colonial development and cultural issues. Um, so I'd like to hand over first to uh, Ajahn Chris to uh, give us an overview of uh, the book and uh, how it came about. Thank you very much, Gwen. Is that sound okay? Yeah, okay, I I'm on. 
I, I'm not really sort of part of this activist group, but I'm a fan, and I helped to put together this book. So I, what I'm going to do, I hope quite quickly, is to explain the background to this whole event. That uh, back in 2019, this group of activists formed something which they called the Southeast Asia Cultural Heritage Alliance. And it's a network of civil society bodies which were interested in issues of heritage all the way across ASEAN. And uh, these are just some of the names of the organizations. Then at the beginning of last year, because the kind of people who are interested in heritage, also the same kinds of people who are interested in climate change and climate action and what to do about it, and are particularly interested in the connections between these two worlds. As a result of that, this conference was organized around this theme, cultural wisdom for climate action. And uh, it had 20 hand-picked speakers. This was not a sort of walk in and open your mouth and talk. These people were identified as being key activists and experts and academics on this issue. And there was also a group of 16 youth representatives from across the region who appeared as well. And uh, this conference came up really with three, three main themes. And the first one was that Southeast Asia has traditional climate-friendly methods for living in harmony with, it, with, it, with nature. And these go back a long way. And these can be, these can be optimized and modernized in very interesting ways. The second point was that Southeast Asia also has traditional architecture and urban design principles that are suited to the climate and careful of nature and careful of resources. And they can also be translated into the modern world and, and used very fruitfully in climate action. And the third theme was that Southeast Asia has spiritual traditions based on historically deep beliefs that wrap nature together with humanity to form a basis for climate action. In other words, the kind of spiritual traditions in this region are a good basis for ac activism. Now, in the book, there are, I, I think, 20, 22, 24 articles. There's a, there's a, a lot of articles, and they, they cover these three themes. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them to give you some idea of it. And on this issue of climate-friendly methods for living in harmony with nature. One of these was this uh, 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 article about indigenous art and the biodiversity crisis by Shaq Koyok. Shaq is a, a, from an indigenous community in Malaysia, and he's an artist, and he's a very good talker, and he's a very wonderful artist. And here he has done many works which are related uh, uh, basically works of activism. This was one about a, you know, uh, the, the government changing policy o over forestry in Malaysia. Uh, here's one he, he does, he paints not necessarily on canvas, but he paints on mats, traditional mats made out of pandan leaves. Uh, and this is an old man in the community saying, where are our rights in a very powerful way. And he uses traditional legends as well. So this is the nightmare uh, scene of the, the trees all, all, always, all being destroyed. And finally, the, the wonderful painting, uh, which he did 10 years ago now, uh, which we use for the cover, which sees this uh, local person looking at the destruction being done by palm oil plantations. Then also in this theme of climate-friendly methods for living in harmony with nature, there was uh, one by on Karen Environmental Stewardship of Natural Resources by Sui Chan and Alexander Green. And Suichan will talk to us a little bit in a minute, but he's a rather remarkable guy. He's a Karen uh, who is now an assistant professor in a university in the middle of Bangkok. He's a very good poet, and he sings as well. 
And pop in his article here, one of the major things that he said was, you know, you look at what has happened to the forests in Thailand. If you see the picture on the left is the 1950s, on the right is 2020, and you can see how much has disappeared. And he just would like to point out is the Karen live down the left-hand side where they have, the forest seems to have survived. And that's important. The second theme was on traditional architecture and urban design principles. One of those done by Lim Gek Siang was about the Georgetown, the UNESCO World Heritage Site there. And she was one of the activists that helped to uh, you know, bring about this UNESCO World Heritage Site. And she's still very, very deeply involved in how that is managed. And she gave a paper which is fundamentally about how the traditional housing in Malaysia, particularly in Penang, uses, uses nature and natural materials in ways which are very clever indeed and which could very well be reutilized in modern architecture. The second paper in this, from this part about traditional architecture and urban design was this, which was new directions in the culturally inspired urban forms of Indonesia's new capital city of Nusantara. And as you may know, uh, Indonesia is in the process of moving its capital out from Jakarta to a new location, which they call Nusantara. And at this conference, most um, remarkably, we had the team which are designing that capital, new capital, to come and explain what they were up to, and particularly this man, Sibarani, who is the head. They had won the competition to design the new capital, which is about turning uh, the, the landscape that looks like that into what they call a smart forest city. So he was explaining all about the principles they were using to retain as much of nature in the way they manage the landforms, to deal with the local cosmology which shows up in traditional design, to translate this into modern forms of building and come up with something that looks, this is supposed to be the center of the future city looking as beautiful as this. And the third theme was about s spiritual traditions that can be used to, to help promote climate activism. And perhaps one of the, uh, one of several, there were several, uh, several articles on this from the point of view of Islam, Christianity, uh, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Uh, but the one which I will talk about is Spiritual Connections to Nature and Climate Change Action, which was done by Prat Anil. He is the deputy abbot of Wat Bamwani Wei, the, the major royal temple in, in Bangkok, and also a holder of a degree from Oxford University. And he, he talked about the way you know, Buddhism can inform climate action. And he talked obviously about things we've known about for a long time, that, you know, the, these ideas of, uh, of ordaining trees to protect them from the saw, but also more interesting uh, recent things, which including uh, monks from a temple which are running a, a recycling center, and an abbot who is known as the solar monk because he has been a great promoter of solar energy. So after this uh, this conference and the production of this book, a delegation from this group went to COP28 in Dubai in, in November, December. Uh, it was partially crowdfunded and it was a very diverse group from very many different communities of the region and they gave various presentations there in, in COP, which I hope they will talk about a little bit. So that's it, that's Sicha. I will stop there. Well, thank you, Chris. I think you've just wet, wetted our appetite for more. That was more. the idea. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so we're actually going to turn now to Kamori Chan Ostananda um, yeah, right. to tell okay. us a little bit about uh, being a youth representative at uh, COP28 and uh, where, it, where it goes from there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gwen. Yes, yeah, so um, as Chris has mentioned, we went to COP28, and what 
I saw there was like the expanse of youth inclusion that hasn't been as apparent um, as compared to, um, sorry, I meant the expanse of youth inclusion that you can see that, that skyrocketed that the past years hasn't been able to kind of gauge at. So these are some examples that I wanted to share with you about why youth were at COP, what, what, what were they about, what have they accomplished at COP. So I was the Thai youth delegate at the conference of the party, so also known, known as COP28, and I get to participate in, in these meetings, sit with like um, high ministerial dialogues where they discussed about global gender stock take, traditional roles of women, um, how that influenced climate change. So this COP in particular was very intersectional. Um, you can see a lot of diverse voices um, from different countries. And here's why um, intersectionality was like the main spotlight at, at COP was because, also because to, tomorrow is International Women's Day. Let's talk a little bit about gender and climate change and, and how it, in, it impacts our region, right? So as you can see in this chart, in this Venn diagram, gender interacts with climate change as well as different sectors of our lives. So for example, if you are a Thai woman living in um, a rural province that engages in agriculture, you would face the adversity of climate change differently than if you were a Thai man in an urban area. So intersectionality at COP was highlighted and it brought about the the underlining and undergirding of youth inclusion because we understand that different social identities interact with climate change differently and COP28 was the hallmark of how do we incorporate different social identities to accomplish um, climate action together and in a way that is cognizant of um, all encompassing aspects of human life. This is also not another example of why intersectionality and why the identity of being youth is so important in climate change. So for example, if you are an, a member of the LGBTQ community or you're female and you're also low income and you're also a caregiver and you're also a black indigenous person of color and you're also disabled or differently abled, however you prefer to be labeled, your um, experience with climate change would be very different from someone who is not. And that is how youth inclusion was um, the hallmark that, that COP wanted to tackle and, and also apparently different aspects in, of social identities as well. So intersectionality is naturally espoused. For example, a, an example that is directly related to climate change is fossil fuels that impact air quality levels are apparently really good, really bad for your health, but individuals with low income or um, black indigenous person of color, they're more likely to reside in areas where these impacted air quality levels are experienced and therefore climate change adversity is a little more, not a little more difficult, but a lot more difficult for them than say other groups. So um, this goes without saying that COP calls for youth inclusion, right? Because youth is among one of the most vulnerable groups um, to climate adversity and by extension, climate migration. So in my free time, I also help out with Southeast Asian youth-led organizations. And we actually discuss about how climate migration is very common in our region, how um, people, especially in Myanmar, are either externally displaced or internally displaced and how we're migrating everywhere just because we're trying to avoid impacts of climate adversity. Um, so I think it brings to question about whether youth as one of the most vulnerable groups, what can they do and how can they experience or pave a different path for the future that they would have to embrace. So that brings about our next section, which is what has youth actually accomplished at COP, being like the most vulnerable group to climate adversity. 
So Dubai, I find, um, they were really embracing of youth inclusion. This COP was actually the first COP um, to witness a historical inaugural global youth statement hand over to the then Minister of State for Youth Affairs, Shama al-Mazri. Um, and what the statement consisted of was basically different perspectives of youth from all over the world uh, who came together and wrote to the Minister of State for Youth Affairs about what can be done uh, for climate change in relation to them. So this was very unique because when people think of COP, people think of maybe Rishi Sunak going up on the podium talking about something or Bill Gates attending, which actually did happen. But another aspect of COP that often goes unnoticed is the youth that also try to propel you know, their own perspectives, which is very much um, needed in, on the stage. The next is uh, the very famous commitment to double down, triple up. This was a very famous statement that um, went into the COP official document. I just found out from another Thai delegate that went to COP that this phrase was coined by just a group of youth that founded an organization called the Global Renewables Alliance just last year. And they came together and they asked themselves, how do they get um, high state, high level leaders to commit to renewables. And so they coined this phrase, very easy, to double down um, on you know, emissions and triple up renewable energy. And it actually made to, the phrase made it to global stages at COP and various commitments and pledges signed. So this also was a very cool example to see how when youth come together and they have an idea and they try to you know, lobby the idea, have like government officials say and pledge it, it actually happened. So this was a very cool um, milestone to witness. The last example I wanted to show you was the loss and damage fund. So this fund, if you don't know, is basically the support that rich countries must offer to um, countries mostly in the global south that are impacted by climate adversity because apparently rich countries who you know create emissions um, do not suffer from climate adversity as much as those who have to bear the brunt of climate change. So this loss and damage fund was created to um, promulgate a more equitable um, dissemination of funding and support to countries um, globally to, to advance the climate action agenda together. And this is a quote by one of the activists um, that went to COP as well. She said that narratives seem to get lost often. We tend to applaud individuals, so let it be known these are some of the youth who have worked on the language of the text, stayed up every night following the negotiations, planned the actions, wrote the press releases, made the communications for comms, worked for an entire year after the loss and damage fund establishment on this campaign. We are the ones that will save us. So I just wanted to share their pictures here um, just so you can see that um, if you've been following COP28 with all the documents signed, all the pledges made, these are also the people behind them. Um, they may be young, but they're very responsible for um, paving their way forward. So many behind many documents are the power, the willpower and determination of youth. Um, and youth is our way forward. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity yeah. to speak here, and I'll pass it on to Gwen. Thanks, Kamari Chan. I'm sure you've raised some <laughs> very relevant issues for our discussion afterwards, and um, we will have some questions after we hear from the, uh, the uh, last two speakers. So I'd like to turn to Dr. Suichan Patanapraiwan, uh, or Ajahn Chi, uh, who's going to give us the in indigenous perspective um, on the relationship between man and nature and uh, how inseparable it is. So, Ajahn Chi, over to you. Hello. There you Hello. are. Hello. Good. We can Hello. hear you. Yeah, okay. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank to um, um, CM Society that uh, um, include me, invite me, and to be a part of uh, this um, 
a lunch book. So, um, and then give me uh, opportunity to share about the current pers perspective about the relationship between nature, um, human and nature, no? So um, I, uh, so um, for the current, or the program, you know, when we, uh, the slide, actually we, please. okay, so do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, okay. So for our current people or Bukhanya people, we also have a, um, a perspective uh, in the relationship of the human and nature. So start from when we was born, uh, with, in, in the general, we think that uh, the nature is, uh, they have the owner of the nature, like a super nature. So when we use, we have to ask the permission. So if we, we, we use without ask the permission, that is mean we, we stole from the, the, the super nature already. So they can, they can punish us. So if they punish us, we have to accept the punishment because of we are stolen for, for them. If we don't want to get the punishment from the super nature, we have to ask the permission uh, so they can allow us to, to, to use as a safe, safety so but when we use we have use enough for we eat so we have eat enough for we have if we use over then we eat the we we we, we will get the punishment from from the super spiritual area and then if we are uh, uh eat over then we have so the nature cannot, uh, how to say it, respond us as well. So this is uh, what uh, we are, uh, our perspective about the, uh, the human and nature. So when we talk about human and nature, we have the connect, how to say it, like um, the thing that I connect human and nature is a uh, super nature. So we cannot live, live only human and nature. We cannot live without super nature because uh, if we live only human and nature, so sometimes human is not respect the nature or something like that. So the example or the case study that uh, we are respect or, or we are, um, how do you say that? We keep the value, high value for the super nature. For example, uh, for example, when we was born, we took the umbilical cord, we put in the bamboo and then we, the father or grandfather have to take the, that bamboo, that uh, umbilical cord inside. We have to rope with the one tree. And then we believe that the tree and the, the, the soul of the child is connected to each other. That tree we cannot cut anymore. So that is mean um, we, uh, we have one forest we call like a umbilical cord forest. No? The second one, when we're living, before, as I mentioned, before we use the water, before we use the land, we have to ask the permission. If we don't ask the permission, we, 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 we believe that, that we, we got the punishment from the supernature. Supernature, we, we won't give us the water for next year. No, we won't uh, take care of our plan for the next year, so we have to ask. Uh, the, another one, when we, we, we have we death in our community, we have to turn the body or the physical of the people who are dead back to the nature, back to the back to the forest. So we are not we are not burned, but we are we are we are we are burned. We call it we 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 we, we turn we return the 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 physical body to to the, to the soil, to the ground, to the earth. We are not burn the people or something like that. So we have also like a, we call it a funeral forest or like a dead forest over there. We don't, we not allow the, the living people use that kind of tree land anymore. So we keep it for the, the dead forest. So it, this is a, um, what is, what is show that we have perspective uh, about the relationship between a human and uh, nature. So, um, uh, we also have, we call like um, uh, pro, pro producing or agriculture system that we call rotational farming. So we, we use this 
like a short term, then we let it uh, regrow like a long term. For example, the place that uh, the, the, the presentation that I, I show this one. So we have like a five, five zone of the rotational family. The first year is a uh, we plan. The second year is a uh, we leave it. We leave it. We leave it regrow. You can see like a five years, and then uh, next six year we will come back again. So, so it means our our land is never empty, but it's all, it's green all the time, something like that. So, uh, we we also plan various plan in our 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 field. Um, this area, I'm, I'm collect the, the variety of plants in the, in the right field. It's more than 80 variety of plants. So that is, that is a, a, we can have like a food security. We can have like, a, 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 not only food security, this is a, like a food sovereignty. No? We, can, we, can, we can eat what we plant. We can plant what we eat here. So this is a, we, we believe that uh, if we dig, Take the soil over then over then the footprints of the, the, the little deer is make the, the the spirit of soil angry. So if they're angry, maybe uh, we plan is not good, our plan is not good, or maybe the the uh, we call like a how to say it, um, the soil erosion will happen because of the the soil the soil spirit angry, something like that. But if we dig only like a only three uh, three ink of, of finger or like a, uh, the same size with little deer footprint. So the uh, soy, soy spiritual will certify and then we will take care of our plants and our plant will grow very well, something like that. No? Um, next slide, let's have. So uh, sometimes the people don't understand why we burn, why we burn our land, our field. Uh, we burn, we burn because of uh, we, we, we have idea that uh, we, the owner or the spirit of fire is uh, the power of uh, like um, the power of um, how to say it? It's not, it's not chemical. It's like a fertilizer. Fertilizer. If we burn it, we burn. It's like a, we sacrifice. We sacrifice the, the, the wood. We sacrifice the leaf of the tree to the spirit of the fire. And the fire will keep us the, the oil of the soil. You can see that the oil of the soil is from, from the fire. So if we burn, our, our, our soil, we have very good oil. So the oil of the soil, it can fit our plant very well. So this is a, the reason why we burn it. And then before we burn, we have a, like a fabric line and then if we don't have fabric line, that is mean um, we 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 are not the fabric line is uh, we we believe that fabric line is like a, the line or the the way that a call the road to call the spirit of the fire to come to the earth or something like that. If if we we don't we don't make the fabric line, even we can burn, but the spirit of the the fire not come to us. So our land is not have the good oil, something like that. So we have the fabric line, and before, before we burn, we have to pray to the, 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 the spirit of the fire that are, please come and burn, burn only our field, not go out, not, should not go out of the fabric line or something like that. Before we burn, we also ask the spirit of the, the, um, the animal inside that area, for example, the spirit of the ants, the spirit of the term, termites, the spirit of the like a crab chopper, grass chopper or something like that. We ask them that please go outside our field because we will ask the spirit of the soil to come, the, the spirit of the fire to come to this land. So it's my heart, it's my burn you. So please go out and then if we, if we finish, uh, we burn and then this year don't come to our field uh, until we harvest. Uh, after we harvest, we will give you some rice and then you can come back to your place. And, after we pray and then we, we burn it. You know? So it's make out, you can see in the, in the, the first picture, we burn only in our field. The, our fire is not, is not come, uh, is not go over, over, overside in, in the land, something like that. This is a, we, be, we believe that spirit of the fire, we will we, we be up, we will be with us if we ask them to come, protect us. 
with with the fiber line something like that uh, next slide เลยครับ so so you can see in the in the our community we don't want to be current perspective that relationship between human natural resource and super natural resource as a 200 years ago 100 years ago because we have to we have to develop our knowledge as we are we have to we have to we have to uh, how to say it conduct our um, life to be as a uh, dynamic you know so now in our in our right field we also uh, fit the honey so some people they say that no money no honey for us if we have honey no forest no honey if we have forest we gonna have honey if we have honey we gonna have money later something like that so we in in our rotational farming uh, we plant various plants and we also have uh, honey in in our in our rotational farming and then we also feed the animal we call like a, um, we call like a farm registry so that is mean our farm is in the forest our farm our animal farm as is in the forest so we believe that that the animal have to go to the forest and then the the the, the spirit of the forest can take care of our, our animal like a cow or buff, buffalo or something like that but every year we have to have the ceremony for the the like we have a we call like a hand 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 risk hendrix for the human we also have we have hendrix for the buffalo as well so when the buffalo we feed the buffalo in the forest you can see the buffalo also have a, like a, some small pond in, in the forest sometimes we call like a buffalo swimming pool in the forest when when the fire forest happen we can use this kind of water from here and then to 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 reduce the fire in the forest as well so that is that is when we feed the the the, the, the animal in the forest also have benefit to the the nature as well so uh, if one one family we have like a five buffalo that is mean one buffalo we can sell like a, a 30000 baht so if we have five that is mean we have we have already um, 150000 baht already so if we would like to have motorcycle we can sell one buffalo we don't need to destroy more the forest we just take care of our animals so this is a farm registry that are harmony with uh, the human life and also harmony with the nature as well so now we not 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 uh, uh, stop only 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 the raw product in the rotational farming we also develop our pro we also process produce the product to make the packaging or something like that so for example now we have dry vegetable we packet it and we can we can transport to other province or sometimes we also transport to our current people in other country as well so we also have a the coffee now we have a, like a karenika coffee karenika we are from karen with the uh, arabica so we call it karenika coffee so coffee is one plants that uh, harmony with the, the the forest we can plant coffee in the forest because of we have forest so we we have a good coffee so because of we have coffee so we have to take care of the forest this is a this is a, our um, perspective between uh, human and nature and then this is uh, the activity that uh, we try to develop ourselves to to be survive in the in the midst of change because uh, we cannot uh, living as a uh, 200 years ago and we stay like an exclusive society in our community but now we are we are like a, our community is changed our world is changed so we we still keep the perspective of current people between a uh, hum, relationship between uh, human and nature but we we change the the activity we change the form of of the product or product to to the to the uh, because then like a couch perspective for for soul perspective for sale as well so we have to balance perspective for soul and perspective for for sale the relationship between nature and human for 
preservation the relationship between human and nature for sale as well. So we would like to survive on our identity base, our knowledge base, and our culture base. If we don't develop the, the new generation, they don't want to follow our ancestor footprints. They don't want like to uh, follow our ancestor perspective in the relationship of human and nature anymore. So we have to change like this. So now we have a lot of new generation, they come back to our community to follow the footprints of uh, the ideology in the relationship between human and human, human and nature in our culture, but they change the form like this. So now they become to like a, uh, we call like a small entrepreneur in our community. So this is uh, the, 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 the perspective of the current people that I would like to share with you. So can you, I would like to conclude in the last one. So in our current uh, perspective to living harmony with human nature and super nature, they compare as a triangle stone. So we believe that if we, our life is balanced like a triangle stone, we can, we can make a fire and then we can put the pot on the pot on the tiger stone and then we can cook the rice, we can cook the food and then we can eat and then we can survive. So the tiger stone, we should have, the first stone is a natural resource. It should be good. The second one, like a spirit or culture identity, it should be good. And then the third one is a, like a economic as well. So economic, nature, spirit. Spirit is mean like a super spirit, uh, super nature. And then culture should, should be together. And then if three things, if balance, we will survive. And then we also have, we have the dignity in the midst of change. The people will accept us. And then we can live in harmony with the nature, harmony with other culture, and harmony with the, the multicultural society as a peaceful living together, something like that. Okay. So this is what I would like to share with you today. So thank you for your attention with my presentation. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Ajanti. I just, um, I might just ask you a very quick question. You, you mentioned the new generation coming back. Where is the new generation coming from? Oh, that is a good question. But my <laughs> professor told me that uh, the good question is uh, not easy to answer. But oh, I try sorry. To answer. <laughs> I have, you only have three minutes. Yeah, yeah. We need to move on. <laughs> okay. I, I, I will try to answer it. Because of the development, the discourse of development is a tech, it took our new generation out of the community. They come in on behalf of education. They come on, they come on behalf of uh, uh, development. In our ancestors, they said that uh, one day the big snake will come to our community and then they, they will swallow, swallow our next generation to the stomach of the, the, the snake. In the beginning, I don't understand anymore. But now I realize that I'm the one that gets swallowed by the big snake. Because when I go to school, when I finish the school in our community, I have to continue my school. If I not continue, my, my parents will get to go to jail because of their, they, I have to finish. At, we call it a basic education. So I have to out of my community, go to the, go to the city to study in the, in the high school. And then I have to continue to to the, the, the uh, higher education. So when I finish uh, higher education, I feel like in my village cannot respond my job for me. I have to go far away with my community to go ha find a job in, out of my community because I already did do it. The uh, higher education, my parents take away more than 300,000 baht already. We have debt already 300,000 baht. I have to find a job to pay the debt back so if I go back to my community, what's going to happen? But now we try to find it. Uh, we call it an internal, not internal, alternative, uh, alternative entrepreneur for, for them. Even though they come back to the community, they can find the money. They can produce their own job. They can use their own cultural capacity, cultural capital, and and be the entrepreneur and, and then can produce the economy in our community and then we can, we can produce the money as well. So 
เว้นเด็กเด็กเด็กคัมแบ็กฟรอมเด็กคัมแบ็กฟรอมเดอะซิตี้บัตออริจินัลลี่เดียฟรอมเอาคอมมิชชั่นเนาะทำจริงเลยเด็ก Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad I asked. Um, we'll come back to <coughs> many interesting points you raised, um, but I'd like to turn, last but not least, to uh, Kun Chulamani c h a t s u w a n a former senior foreign ministry official who, I think, can can really uh, 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 turn some thoughts towards how do we uh, embrace. Culture and this kind of imperative uh, uh, to preserve and uh, leverage uh, cultural heritage uh, in national climate change policy. So, over to you, k u n c h i l a m a n i Thank you very much. From excellent explanation about community-based culture and the relation between man and nature, I will take very different approach. Uh, because I will walk you through international discourse on the issue of uh, cultural wisdom and climate action, which has been ongoing for at least the past five years. Uh, let me start in uh, 2021, when uh, UNESCO, ECOMOS, and IPCC organized the international meeting uh, on culture, heritage, and climate change. This meeting aims to take stock of the state of knowledge regarding connection of culture and heritage with climate change, as well as uh, build new conversation and collaboration in this field. The leftmost publication is the result of this meeting, and the uh, three publication on the right are the white papers by expert on three themes of the meeting. Actually, I think the the, the left uh, publication is very interesting. If you are interested, you can check in the website. What strikes me most is this: uh, among the approximately 100 participants in this meeting, from 40 countries across all six continents, none were from Southeast Asia. I will touch on the this absence of Southeast Asian expert in this. Global discourse later. Then move forward to G20. Uh, G20 ministers of culture meeting in 2021 in Rome, and in 2023 in Buenos Aires, specifically mention about culture-led mitigation and adaptation that can leverage action for climate empowerment. The meetings, the two meetings, also encourage continued dialogue. And exchange of expertise on climate action across culture work stream. And then, in the this is the what mentioned in the the, the latest uh, statement from last year. And then in Dubai last year, uh, before COP28 in Dubai, civil society across the world join hands in this global call to put cultural heritage. Arts and creative sectors, and the heart of climate action. Um, you can see that uh, CSHA and the Siam Society, under royal patronage, are uh, proudly among the founding signatories of this call. A number of Thai personalities are uh, among 100, uh, approximately 1,500 1, people who signed on this call to action. This group will call advocate state party to UNFCCC to adopt a joint work on culture and climate action decision, or which is called JWD, at the COP. This JWD, if adopted, will begin a consultative process to address the gap of understanding on the full contribution of culture to climate action. It would pave the way to the adoption as subsequent COP on a work program to put culture and heritage at the heart of climate action. Unfortunately, the proposed uh, joint work decision was not included in time in the COP28 agenda, <coughs> so the advocacy remains to be continued. Despite this setback, we can see that uh, we can see that uh, 
COP28, this is the global fall. Uh, despite this setback, you can see that the COP28 has achieved remarkable progress on the issue of culture and climate change. First, the one of the major agreements that achieved at COP28 was on a new framework for achieving the global goal on adaptation, which for the first time identified cultural heritage as one of the seven core themes of this uh, global goal on adaptation. Second, uh, this is so much uh, in, in the news about the establishment of loss and damage fund, which will provide financial support to developing countries for recovery, reconstruction, and rehabilitation of cultural heritage that have been impacted by climate change. And the third point, the COP28 saw the convening of the first ever multilateral high-level high ministerial meeting on culture-based climate action shared by Brazil and UAE. Uh, more than 20 ministry, ministers of culture or representative from more than 20 countries, as well as relevant international uh, organizations and international civil society participate in this meeting. The meeting adopted the uh, Emirates Declaration on Culture-Based Climate Action, which among other things, established a group of friends of culture-based climate action at the UNFCCC. This group of friends is an informal coalition of UNFCCC parties focused on strengthening political momentum for an effective action to support culture and heritage-based climate action um, at the, in the UN, in UNFCCC. Uh, so this is the, this move represents the move from civil society advocacy to, to government level. It should be noted, however, that according to our research, why the GCC, global co uh, the, the global co on adaptation and loss and damage fund have got some coverage in media. None of the mainstream media have reported on the first ever Minister of Culture meeting during COP, nor the establishment of the group of friends. It should also be noted that among the 20 plus ministers of culture attending this meeting, very few were from Asia and none from Southeast Asia, despite CISHA ongoing efforts to encourage their respective government to attend. <coughs> I would like to conclude my intervention with two remarks. First, it is widely recognized that currently climate change represents one of the greatest threats to culture and heritage. From the physical damage of increasing temperature, fires, floods, and drought, to the stress this force placed on the practice and transmission of knowledge in society. The GGA, the Global Goal on Adaptation, and the Loss and Damage Fund, as well as the widespread media coverage on these two issues reflect such recognition. However, there is still too little recognition among general public, and if I may say, among media, that culture and heritage could also be a solution to climate change and could also be essential resources of creativity for adaptation and mitigation actions. But from my intervention earlier, you can see that there is international trend that is pointing towards more recognition of culture-based climate actions including in the UNFCCC itself. My second remark is that I have mentioned about the absence of Southeast Asian experts in the UNESCO meeting in 2021. 
I have also mentioned about the absence of Minister of Culture from Southeast Asia in the first Minister of Culture meeting at COP28. This, however, this by no means reflects that Southeast Asia do not take this issue seriously. The success of the conference that CISHA organized in uh, 2023 and as well as the work that CISHA has been doing in the past two years, past three years actually, we have called for proposals from young cultural activists in Southeast Asia to speak about culture-based climate action at our monthly online forum called Shatam, and we have never run out of proposals. So I think it is fair to conclude that the interest and efforts, especially among cultural <coughs> activists in Southeast Asia, in the issue of culture-based climate action have existed probably in a sporadic manner and uh, not, not really put into the uh, really systematic manner. And the conference that CISHA and the Siam Society organized in January 2023, which resulted in the publication that we are launching today, is probably the first attempt in Southeast Asia to open conversation on this important issue on a regional level. And hu I humbly believe that this publication could not fill in all knowledge gap that we need to fully comprehend the contribution that the rich heritage of Southeast Asia could contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. But it is an important first step in that direction. I thus call for heightened interest, more rigorous research, and definitely more actions to walk the talk on culture-based climate actions. It is crucial to not only keep up with global advancement on this issue, but also to tackle head on the more pressing challenge that we humans are facing today. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Karim uh, Chilamani. Uh, so now I think uh, there are probably some questions uh, in the audience, although I, I would actually just like to follow up on a couple of things. And one I thought uh, was, was your point uh, uh, about uh, Komori Chan, about the uh, youth. And whether, you know, being a Thai representative, but talking about how this whole, I think a lot of climate change push is generated by youth. And uh, I guess uh, little Greta was the kind of poster child of, uh, of all that. Um, however, uh, I think um, in a way you were saying that there was uh, actually, am I right in thinking you were implying there was a bit of a disappointing show of Asian or at least Thai youth, uh, not that many, not much government support. Do you feel that, you know, Asia is really, even though we're here to talk about how Southeast Asia could maybe set an example, uh, it didn't sound like Southeast Asia was making a big uh, youth mark in uh, COP28. What are the issues there? Well, I think I'd like to begin with the word like youth activist. In Thailand, especially, it has a negative connotation with our culture, how you're supposed to be loud and you're supposed to yeah. only propel sure. your ideas. I think activism for among youth is very applauded in the West, but in Thailand, it's rather something that um, the young hesitate to entertain, whether they're a youth activist. But what's interesting is that the um, party of youth delegates uh, from Thailand that went this year, most of them um, were either self-funded or they acquired funding from other NGOs that were not from the Thai government. So they technically um, participated in activities that allowed them to 
say their, their piece of mind or opinions pertaining to their own lived experiences, which I thought was very um, cool that they get that opportunity in the future should the government you know, provide more funding to, to support. I mean, I'm, I'm saying as if the funding existed, it does not exist currently for Thai youth at COP, but should the government provide any funding um, for the youth delegates? I, I don't know to what extent the youth would be able to engage in, in those meetings and activities and express um, their lived experiences. And I do think training is also an important aspect where um, we, as Thai youth delegates that went to COP, we have not been trained um, in what to say in meetings, um, what we cannot say. I wasn't sure myself what points I could touch upon, but I tried to optimize the experience um, as much as possible. So, yeah, that's, mm. that's my piece of mind. Well, thanks for that. That's obviously uh, <laughs> something that maybe Thailand and the new government should focus on since they're trying to make a splash on uh, on key areas like this. Um, Chris, do you have any anything to add about uh, the inclusion? <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, Ajahn Chi, if you're listening, I mean, you know, the same applies to what you're, what, everything you're talking about with indigenous, you know, ethnic groups and their representation at, at COP. Did you feel, um, Thailand or the region had adequate representation in international circles. Hmm. Come in. Hello. <laughs> Ajahn Chi. Oh, maybe he's gone. Maybe he's uh, taking a nap. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to him. Um, so I think we've got some questions, and uh, the first goes to the excellent Christopher. Um, maybe you want to introduce yourself and, and maybe tell people about what you've been doing on the climate change front. Uh, Gwen started uh, earlier tonight by saying, I was to ask a hard question. Ah, so don't blame me. Before I get to the hard questions, I think I will give a little introduction. I'm Christopher Moore. I'm a storyteller, and in, in 2019, I founded CCCL, which is Changing Climate, Changing Lives, to inspire young Thai filmmakers to make films showing the impact of climate change in their local communities. This year, we had over 400 submissions. We grew from just Thailand, and now we're in ASEAN, as well as in Japan. And so I think the original goal was to inspire, and I think indeed we have inspired a lot of young Thais to pick up a camera and to tell a story. Because stories are the way that we communicate most effectively with one another. The problem with a lot of the climate change dialogue is that the story is not very interesting is statistical, it's scientific. So for the 10% of the audience that's here, that's the normal kind of story they like. But for most people, it's not. They're turned off by it. Getting to the hard question, one of the things that's emerged over the last five years from founding this festival is a common theme of hundreds and hundreds of films from Indonesia, the Philippines, here, Japan. What they seem to have in common is at the root of the problem that is the cause of climate change. It's that we have an economic system that is antithetical to changes that are required in a sufficiently short period of time in order to reduce the damage that's already been done. Major corporations have known about the change of climate since the 1990s. 30 years later, there have been very few, if any, sub significant or substantive changes in the econ economic model. Presidents and prime ministers run on the fact that they have increased GDP as if that's a good thing. 
And in some ways it is a good thing, but in other ways it's not. So the question that I have is really, how do we reconcile an economic system which basically controls the policymakers and the politicians, and as a result, they continue business as usual. There may be the odd attempt for public relations purposes to appear that they're doing something differently, but underneath, you really feel that they are. How, in other words, do we get an economic system to change itself? Mm. That is a hard question, and it could also be a long one, but maybe uh, <laughs> which of the panellists would you like to uh, have a go at that one? <laughs> um, Chris, come on, you're, you're nodding sagely. I mean, Chris, you've, you, you've identified you know, the big difficulty um, very astutely. And we have then to look at the politics of this because in the end, if you're going to change about this, you, you, there has to be a political mechanism. Um, at, at the moment, the corporations run the world, is what you're saying. And, but this hasn't always been the case. I mean, we, we have to think that the extent to which uh, our lives um, in so many aspects are dominated by the decisions and the will of not very many large corporations. It's something relatively new. Even if you go back 20, 25 years, it wasn't quite the same as this. There was uh, a much bigger, um, if you like, social input into the way that countries were run. Uh, and it's not, it's become much cruder over that time. So you, you have to have a, a certain degree of optimism that change can take place. Uh, to me, and, and this is a very difficult one too, uh, is that the example of China is worth looking at, right? Because China today is if you like, the, the almost the only standout ag against this system, because it still has a state system which is prepared to beat down the big corporations when they want to, and they've done it a lot over the last 20 years when they want to. Jack Ma is just you know, one example of what they're capable of doing. Um, and we have also to consider um, that what they have done in the area of moving economy away from the fossil fuel model towards something else is a million miles ahead of everything else in the world, you know? I mean, they have, you know, what is it, two-thirds of the EVs, 90% of the production of, 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 of solar, and, and go on and go on and go on. They're just a million miles ahead in, in this stuff. And partly by now, of course, there's quite a lot about the China model we may not want to to accept, and we have to accept. You know, that there's a lot of tra trade-offs going here. But it, if you take the t the base of that, is the principle that a state, when it is su properly organised with supports from within the society uh, can do things, which is not just uh, pleasing the handful of corporations which make the major profits in the world. So um, I, think, I think probably the, th the third thing I would say then, um, I still think the capacity for popular action is there. Okay, and, and it, it will, I think it will show in this issue, but it won't show until it's almost too late, you know, when people really do rebel against shell, <laughs> if you like, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it will happen, but not quite yet. 
Thanks, Chris. I think you're saying that uh, authoritarian regimes are good when they're very good and bad when they're really bad. Uh, in other words... Uh, no, right. I, I'm not saying that, but, but I, I'm saying state authority mm. you know, can be very powerful yes. uh, in ways which we have forgotten about because right. states have been taken over right. by corporations. That's what right. I'm saying. Okay? Exactly. So it doesn't have to be a China-type state. No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, could I add something to trying to answer this very difficult question? In my another hat, uh, I sat in a meeting uh, with many private sectors, Thailand, Thai companies, and they complained that Thai governments uh, a nationally determined commitment in DC is too slow because they need to show the world that their production line is green. That is what the market expects at the moment. And if they wait until Thailand become uh, net zero and carbon neutrality by 2050 or 2065, it is too late. They need it now. They need to be green now. Because they need green electricity. If not, nobody will invest here. They need green raw material with good traceability. So I still believe in the power of market to help, to support, to push forward green transition and uh, these companies complain, although they, of course they have to invest a lot in, in green transition. But if the market wants things to be green, they have to go green as soon as possible, or at least before their competitors. I, in, in the same manner, I heard another private, private sector scream at the news about another neighboring country uh, uh, in the news that they can produce that the whole supply chain of rice, their rice production is green and we still could not do that. It's the same concept. I think market principle is very important and we need to do that. And why, when, where market, when my market demand come from, it's come from people. So it come back again to the issue of how we, can be, we have to uh, trying to push this issue so that people will believe and will demand for green products. It can go back again to, to culture which can be developed. We, can, we have to empower consumers to demand for things green and then the world will go green. That's, that is my belief. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if, uh, oh, I see we have a, another question, please. Please, yep, just tell us who you are and where are you from. Uh, I, my name is Ray Schoenfeld. Um, I'd like to take one specific example which uh, might throw some light on the general observa observation that uh, Gwen made that uh, if you look at the results of what happened at COP28, um, it's pretty hard to identify um, any ways in which ASEAN is acting as a model, a beacon for the world. Um, and it draws, the, the one example that I'd like to quote um, draws on uh, Chris's comments also. The example comes from, I'm terribly sorry that I can't, see the name of, of your name, uh, the youth rep <laughs> representative, is it Kanek? Kamori Chan. Kamori Chan. Kamori Chan. Okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry, only That's Gwen right. and Chris have name cards <laughs> that are large enough to read. Uh, but um, uh, you had one slide there about the agreement that the involvement of young people um, achieved or contributed to uh, and that was the agreement to treble the use of renewable energy uh, in the world. And I think your slide said that 60 countries had signed up to that. And 
the number of countries that have signed up has grown considerably since COP28. The, the last figure that I saw was about uh, a month ago. Uh, it's now at 118 countries. Now, um, mo so most of the world is signing up to, to an agreement to contribute to one of the most important measures that can be taken to combat climate change. It's not the only measure, but it's an important one to uh, develop the use of renewable energy. Now, eight of the 10 countries in ASEAN have not signed that agreement. Thailand has not signed that agreement. And my question is how you can, <laughs> how you in Thailand can claim that you're acting as, as, as a beacon to the world when you can't even sort your own answer out to, to que a question like that uh, of uh, developing renewable energy as uh, a solution to, mm. as, as one solution to climate action. What's going on in Thailand? What do you see um, uh, the youth of Thailand saying and doing on, this on, uh, on that specific issue? I think um, from my experience at COP, there were two different parties. So one was the youth delegates, which are funded by s different organizations that are not from the Thai government. And then there were the, um, the delegates from the Thai government. And when we were at COP, we get to talk to each other for a bit. And I guess that was the first time that we exchanged ideas um, such on, on renewable energy, on um, cultural um, heritage and climate action. And that was the first time that they acknowledged Thai youth and our role in being able to participate in international stages and be ab being able to um, engage in these conversations. So I think COP28 is definitely a start for them to see that we exist in these spaces too, and not only high level ministerial um, officers. And I think it also kind of destigmatized like activism or advocacy for the Thai government because um, for them, I guess, they were able to perceive how when youth are interested in a certain um, area of interest or a certain, say, vertical of, of climate action, whether it be culture, whether it be renewable, whether it be, I had one Thai youth delegate who worked in finance and, and AI, um, they get to see the diversity of our perspectives and how we can contribute differently. And we definitely um, are in contact with um, the Thai government officials, um, the Ministry of um, the Environment and Natural Resources. Um, and we submitted reports that were asked, requested from us. And we hope that they would read our reports and implement some of our recommendations in the future um, whenever they think that the youth could be more involved with COP29 or perhaps any other government, um, governmental spaces that they potentially see us there. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And uh, so yeah, if, if possible, I have a question too. I'm new here, so I will introduce myself. Chaco Dijk is my name. I'm originally from the Netherlands. I'm a sustainable urbanist worked as a sustainable urbanist in the Netherlands and as a politician, and I worked as a director of sustainability in Australia. I moved to Bangkok, to Thailand, uh, last November to set up my own consultancy in sustainable urbanism. Thank you, first of all, for this evening. It's, it's very interesting and very inspiring for me, too. Um, am I allowed to ask another question to, uh, to Kun Kamorichan? Yes, um, you can. <laughs> Um, because the youth is the future, of course, so, uh, yeah. so maybe that's, that's why. So back in Europe, you see that young people are really involved in protesting, in, in call for action. Um, and that's not only because it's their future, but also because, and that's what I, what's getting more and more attention, because of mental health issues. And so the young people are more depressed because they hear that hey, the world is going to collapse, uh, everything is bad, and those kind of things. 
And I know that mental health in Asia is a, is a different thing than in Europe, but is there also potential for mental health for the youth here in Asia, Southeast Asia? And was that a subject in COP as well? Mm. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Mental health is definitely something that I think the youth in Asia and Thailand are more aware, although of course there are cultural stigma um, cultural stigmas attached to mental health. Um, I think a lot of Thai media has to put more effort into depicting uh, safe and ethical mental health um, awareness and information that is portrayed in the media. I do think that um, there's not enough of accurate portrayals of mental health issues that actual people suffer from in, in the Thai media, so that might also inform um, Thai youth to better understand and engage with mental health um, spaces ethically. There are a lot of, I believe, government-funded projects that <coughs> propel Thai, Thai youth to talk more about their mental health. One is called the Wall of Sharing, um, which I believe the Ministry of Public Health is funding as well, so that is a way forward. Um, at COP, I do know that uh, mental health and doom scrolling and, and anxiety about the future and about how environmentalism is collapsing is, is very much discussed among the youth. But at, at COP, I, I'm not too sure whether that point was highlighted as much as, as other points. And I do think it's because it's not, it's not perceived as something attached um, with economic value or, or um, political value um, that can be used for leverage in negotiations because essentially the COP is you know, a negotiation conference. So I hope in the future mental health will be more widely discussed and it, it shouldn't be something, a factor that is used on the table to discuss like si new deals in signing or um, more more money being put on the table for different policies. I, I hope that mental health is discussed as an ethical um, implementation of, you know, reg in regards to human life and, and how we care for each other in the face of climate change. Thank you. Would any of you have a, I'm not sure if, uh, I'll just give one more go to uh, Ajahn, Ajahn Chi. Are you uh, online there? No, I think he's left us. <laughs> okay. <Thank> you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You've got to be quick with him. Yeah. Uh, Chris? Um, <coughs> uh, re reflecting on these last uh, two questions, um, I, a couple of years ago, did quite a lot of research on th the climate issue in Thailand. Part of it for writing something for the UNDP and partly just because of my own personal interest. And uh, you know, you find there is a, a community of academics and officials in the Ministry of the Environment and other ministries who are very uh, committed about climate, climate issues, you know? And they produce rather good research and they produce rather good policies and so on and so forth. But you know, in the last government, you know, General Prayut uh, presided over one of the first uh, conferences about sustainability and climate and at the end of his speech, he announced the commissioning of a new coal-fired power plant. I mean, you, you have to be in another planet to, to do something like that. And mm. a, a couple, I think, very few weeks ago, uh, our current Prime Minister, Kunseta, he spoke uh, again at one of these conferences about that. And he announced, uh, he announced partly, you know, we're going to drill, drill, drill in the Gulf for a start. And he then announced that, some, uh, that they were going to commit uh, to using more liquefied gas uh, uh, in, Thai, in Thai energy, and that was a green policy. I, I mean, <laughs> you, you just gasp that when you are dealing with people who, who have this kind of mentality, who have the real power. Well, it's better than coal, isn't it, LNG? <laughs> You're pro-Australia, are you? Yeah, yeah <laughs> okay. no, can't say that. So, so. So 
so it's, it's very difficult. And, and underneath you know, uh, the, the attitude of the politicians, whether it's Prayut or Seta, whoever, is the fact that it is not a burning issue in Thailand or most of Southeast Asia yet. You know, you look at you know, the transnational surveys of concern over climate change, and Southeast Asia comes out really relatively low. And, and it's not difficult to understand that because, you know, if you've been in Europe, you know, you have seen the flora and fauna change around you because it's very sensitive to, to small changes in, in temperature. Where I used to live, and we used to have snow every now, they're growing wine now, you know. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary change. And they've also had these, you know, massive uh, climatic disasters over the last few years. You've either had huge floods or, or huge droughts or whatever. There's no, nothing yet of equivalent uh, violence, if you like, happened in Southeast Asia. Because here, we are used to the fact that the climate is violent and variable. The monsoon is a very you know, violent thing. It changes every year. It floods here and it droughts there and so on and so forth. And it might have changed a little bit. It's, it is. It's, it, it's right. Statistically, it is getting more variable. But people here, uh, through generations, have been accustomed to variability and violence in the natural environment, whether it's volcanoes or you know, uh, earthquakes or whatever. So climate change is not coming up. As such, such a big issue. And as long as that is the case, uh, the politicians will still drill baby drill, you know, as long as they can. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to add? So, uh uh. <laughs> Excellent. Peter? Hi, my name is. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, my name we is can. Peter Bassett, and I'm a sustainability communication strategist. And, um, I'm familiar with the CTAR conference last year. I didn't attend, but I had a friend travel here to attend, and it was quite amazing, apparently, and very inspiring from the youth voices from around ASEAN, particularly. So I look forward to reading your book. Um, a question, though, on this issue of engaging politicians, and I'm not sure if I, if I address it to you, Tulamani, or, and I know that, um, Chris, you said you were a fan of CTAR, but not necessarily involved in it. I mean, is Sicha, so the question is, is Sicha engaging in an advocacy position in any way with the government and with politicians? So is it to Dr. Chulamani? Or? Sicha uh, is network of uh, cultural heritage uh, of, of people, I mean, of civil society who are active in cultural heritage. Uh, we we hope we can get some funding from government, but no. <laughs> uh, we we can may have some government funding uh, for some project, but uh, we do not receive any uh, uh, any consistent funding or instruction from from any government. It is really network among among activists in cultural heritage field. Well, maybe it's good that you're not tied to them for funding, but maybe they can attend your conference next time and participate or listen in a round table or something <laughs> to hear what's happening. Thanks, Peter. Anyone else want to comment on that, uh, Peter's point? Mm. No. Okay, I think um, on that note, I should mention that copies of this uh, uh, great book uh, are on sale at a special price here tonight for 500 baht over there. Uh, so, if you are interested, uh, um, this is a good chance to get Arjun Chris to, um, to autograph it. <laughs> My name is not on the book at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, in that case, whatever, you know, maybe this is your swan song with Siam Society. Maybe it'll, you can sell it on eBay at some point when you <laughs> try. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining us and please do look at our website and Facebook. Think about International Women's Day tomorrow 
and uh, some of our interesting events next week. And uh, thank you again. Thanks to our panelists and uh, and Kuntam, our audiovisual maestro. Good night. <laughs> I think someone forgot to tell.